Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 67. This episode is Robin Guyver, who is delightful. He also further proves my theory that the uh, creature department at Pinewood Studios are made of the best, most talented people ever. And uh, you know what? Robin is no exception. He was so great. Uh, we had a really good time talking. He is an incredible actor. Um, everything that I've seen from his reel to his work to his puppetry to everything that we talked about, just top, top, top notch and a great dude. So fun to talk to. Uh, we talk about his uh, his growing up in theater and how he learned puppetry and stuff like that and then got into movies. His first movie being Gravity with Sandra Bullock, which is nuts. So he's got some great behind the scenes with that. We talk about uh, his work on Fantastic Beasts, which was amazing. Obviously, we cover Star Wars. He was the Hapabore. He actually was the piece of the Hapabore that knocked over John Boyega as Finn. He was also the puppeteer behind the head of the Thala Siren. So in kind of a weird way, I feel like I've completed a set, having had Tom and Derek on, who were inside the Thala Siren, and now uh, Robin, who was the head. And he has a hilarious story about that. And he's got so many great stories, guys. You, you, have, you have no idea. He talks about working on life. He talks about uh, the process. He talks about everything, and he's so great. And this was so fun, and you're really going to love it. More creature peeps, guys. More creature peeps. Hashtag PFX, Puppet FX Crew. Um, yeah, so you know what? I'm going to stop talking. Please enjoy the interesting podcast, episode number 67, with Robin Guyver. Theme song time. <laughs> I said, I'm just glad when actors are working, you know, so it's like any time I can work around you. If you're willing to give me the time, I'm willing to work with you for whatever's more convenient, you know? So sure, we'll appreciate it. Thank you. Because you're an actor yourself, right? I try my best. <laughs> oh, fantastic. So what, what's going on for you right now? Uh, so far, this podcast. I, uh, I just oh, wrapped a couple cool. short films recently. Uh, so those have been cool. Those have been cool. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, you're, in, you're in London. That's correct. Yes. Right on. Are you from there? Uh, I am, yes. I was uh, born here, raised here. Um, my wife is from Dallas, Texas. We met over here, though. So, hey. um, uh, yeah, we've got it. There's an American connection. <laughs> right on. I've been to Dallas. It's huge. Oh, fantastic. Not yep, as big yep, as London. <laughs> yep. I, I, prob I probably wouldn't have been there if my if my wife and I hadn't met, but um, uh, but I have, and I've got family there, and I love it. Right on, right on. Yeah, I, uh, I was just talking to someone about this recently that, like, I, I was in London uh, two years ago. And uh, mm -hmm. my silly American mind was like, you know, they say it's big, but like America is pretty big, you know. And then I get there and I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, no, it's it's much bigger. It's way bigger than <laughs> I expected. It's a massive yeah. city. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, I was unprepared. I was unprepared for just the mm -hmm. sheer size of it. Uh, anything in the, with the American cities for me is like where, where you've got to drive, where you can't walk is, um, yeah, it's very alien to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, mm -hmm. I can't imagine driving in London. It's uh your streets are just it. I somebody once told me that uh the road map of London just looks like a cracked windshield, and I was like, yeah, fair, <laughs> fair. I mean, granted, uh, the had... secret to travel in London. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're fine. The secret to travel in London, I just covered is is that um, uh, cars um take forever, but if you go on a bicycle, you get there within half an hour. Oh, smart, yeah. smart. So Assuming uh, you know where you're going. <laughs> well, yes, yes, that does make a big difference. Yeah. Whereas I'd be to, to cycle in Dallas or, or pretty much any other American city would uh, would scare me very much. So fair, yeah. fair. Yeah, it's mm. massive. And but then you guys have the underground, which is pretty incredible. Uh, yeah, it's good. Um, I said it gets so busy. I don't know if you've ever been on it. Uh, if, um, I have, especially during what we call rush hour. But man, it's um, it's quick. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. people are it's in quick, and out. but it, yeah, but it's it gets very packed. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I have this like video on my phone from when we went to. I mean, you have to see Buckingham Palace when you visit, and uh, so we did that. And the Hyde Park exit to the underground. I just took uh -huh. like ten seconds of video, and there's just <laughs> hundreds of people going in and out, and I'm like, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
crazy. They're like the kind of the, the arteries and veins of city. Yeah, that's exactly right. Craziness. Mm. But when so I actually have seen the um uh what was it called? The Dear Brother video that you did. Oh wow, oh fantastic. So, that's thanks great. For making me cry. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. You know, you know, of all of all the things I've done, um I, that 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 little kind of short ninety second um, spec commercial has had the most kind of people reaching out to me. People I've, you know I've never met before from all, from all over the world saying, "Wow, that really really moved me." And yeah, um, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm very honoured. Uh, I and mean, the guys behind it, Daniel and Dorian, the directors who kind of wrote it and shot it, and you've go, gone on to more kind of exciting things now in their professional careers. Really, were the masterminds behind it. And so I always try and kind of big them up as much as possible. But it was a, it was a pleasure to be part of it. It's beautiful. I think. Also, because I have a brother, it hit home, and I was like, "Well, mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't know I was going to cry today, but hmm, here we uh-huh. are." <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, they've constructed it so beautifully as well. You know, it's um, yeah, it's a really kind of wonderful, moving piece. And we shot that in two days. You know, we were up in really? the um, in in the Highlands. You know, kind of drove up uh, uh, Matt and I, who 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 plays the um, my brother in it. Um, mm-hmm. We we never met before. We flew. I, um, and met uh, in Glasgow Airport. He and then Matt drove us up past Loch Ness, up to um, uh, up to the Isle of Skye, and um, up there, it's. It, I mean, it, it is as beautiful as it looks. It really is. It's a fantastic part of the world. Um, and amazingly, it didn't rain on us very much. And wow. in two days, we kind of we shot in about kind of six or seven locations. Um, and and the guys scouted that. They did their location scouting on Google Maps using the satellite view. No way. Uh, because they because they, they couldn't get over it for enough time in advance. So they scouted most of the locations using um, using Google satellite view, and then kind of actually went there in one day, zipped around the morning in person, going, "Yeah, that's going to work. This is going to work." And they shot a couple of the wide shots with with the crew in costume um, because they didn't have us for enough time, mm-hmm. um, and and then we spent two days kind of running around like mad in 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 the cars, getting all that footage. Wow, that is amazing to cobble that together in two days. Oh, they're incredibly resourceful pair, and their producers as well, and their camera team, uh, their cameraman Yan as well. Was, they're all fantastic. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a real kind of dream team to work with. Sure, I mean it shows mm-hmm. when you get the right mm-hmm. people making the right thing, magic happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so big up Daniel and Doran. We'll have a look at their other stuff, their other commercials they've made. They're they're really gonna be kind of people to watch for the next kind of five ten years. Yeah, absolutely. So mm-hmm. when did you start acting then? Uh, oh wow, um, uh, that's uh, that's a great question. When did I start acting? I guess um, I I did school plays and drama clubs for years and years and years when I was a kid. And I think I, I was something that really had a big impact on me was I was um, in a youth theatre. You guys have youth theatres in America? Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, yeah, as, as a young person, kind of after school club type thing. Um, the youth theatre I was at was based at. Uh, uh, the National Theatre in London, which is this big kind of theatre, which is uh, mainly supported by the state. Um, it gets a lot of government funding, which allows them to make kind of quite risky projects, interesting plays, a lot of community work. So, sure. so work with young people. Um, and one of the big projects they do is something called Connections, where they get a bunch of professional playwrights, I think 10 professional playwrights. They each write a play aimed at young people. Those plays get sent out to different schools over the country and school groups. Uh, put them on. They send wow. out judges. Pe- people watch them, um, and they bring the, the kind of the the best ones um, to the actual national theatre, the professional stage. So those young people get to perform on a professional stage. It's an amazing, amazing event. Um, and it's not what I did. I turned <laughs> up there. Um, uh, I, I lived. I lived in London, and I I came onto youth theatre, which they used as kind of guinea pig young people. So the writers could kind of write their write their plays. Sure. And, being aged anywhere from you know, 20 to 60 to 70, um, we were a group of young people who could say, would you say this? We'd be like, oh, no way, man. <laughs> um, or, or like, would you guys do this? Or is that funny? Is that not funny? We, they kind of bounce ideas of us and, and, and we, we'd kind of be authentic young people and say yes, no, and um, and, and uh, stuff like that. We got a chance to work with kind of amazing playwrights like Philip Ridley, uh, Mark Ravenhill. Um, I, I don't know if these names will mean anything to anyone, uh, <laughs> but... but um, in retrospect, looking back, I had no idea how lucky I was. And it was, um, yeah, it was a really kind of incredible experience. Sure, sure. That's great. So mm-hmm. it was something so, you, yeah. like really early on you're just really into. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, and then, then kind of was keen to kind of uh, uh, go into acting, going before and going into the world of kind of theater. And it's very much theater for me when I was younger and, and um, growing up, going to the theater with my parents and stuff. Um, and um, 
and so I kind of went off and did a drama degree that turned out to be very academic and and with way too much writing um, <laughs> and I kind of rebelled a bit against that and um uh, kind of started watching and and reading and studying a lot about the world of circus and and movement and physical performance and and was exposed to kind of some amazing theatre artists like Simon Burney who started a company called Complicite um, and then people like that and got very hooked on this idea of actors who create their own work and theatre companies who who rather than creating the work of just a writer they they work as an ensemble and make work as a team and that that's kind of really changed my my world really looking at rather than working for someone else being dependent on someone else saying hey come along and be in my project um but looking for groups to work with when i was at university and then and then for the rest of my life since then really to go let's make something together let's be the authors of our work and and create things and, sure um, yeah and so um yeah, and went went into started in the world of theatre, doing a, a very kind of physical training, in a in a kind of quite clowning, movement based uh, art form. Use a lot of masks, a lot of puppetry, um, where which is tradition I guess we call poor theatre. Mm-hmm. And and this poor theatre is where you've got nothing and you try and make everything. You've got a small space and you make the audience see feel like they're somewhere huge. Oh. and vast and epic. You know, it draws in all the kind of traditional storytelling techniques um, um, and and tries to kind of tell big stories with very little resources um and yeah that's that was my road into uh into kind of the world of performance wow that's genius so i like to hear about yeah. people who like have taken any sort of acting class because different techniques you pick up like i talked to one person and i asked them i was like you know what's something that you've learned over your acting career over your courses that you've t- that you've learned what do you take mm-hmm. from it and they're like well mm-hmm. i always learn never judge yourself because while you're doing it, you're you're in your head and you're not the character. And the character wouldn't judge themselves for what they're doing. I was like, wow. And the idea that you're saying, like, to have a small space and to make it feel bigger, that is a great, great uh, exercise or something mm. like that. Makes total sense. Yeah, cool. Sorry, that was yeah, that was that was a huge bit of uh, diarrhea there. I didn't realize I'm, I'm quite oh, tired dude, at this that's... end. We just got the kids to bed, so excuse me if I <laughs> if I go on a lot. Dude, that is the show. That it, you'll you'll learn. This is a. It's not an interview. It's just a chat. Mm-hmm. Just talking about whatevs. I'm here to talk about cool. you, man. And cool. you you did theater, and I love your stuff. I've seen your your reel is incredible. Like oh cool, I, thank you. I, I one of my uh, I love the editing side of it as well. So that I get to cut them myself. So I really nice. enjoy that. Dude killed it, killed it. You have cool. one of those like certain people just come across on screen as like oh okay yes I can see this person in everything, and your reel mm-hmm. is one of those. I was like, wow, this cool. is really, really good. Like, I, I've seen the Dear Brother thing. I haven't seen most of the projects that are in the reel, and I'm totally invested just by the cool. clips you put in your reel. That's so. great, because most of the world haven't seen most of those projects. Most of them are <laughs> very, one, very, very wonderful, but very, very little-known <laughs> short films and things like that. But, um, but yes, I, I think you should be a casting director, Brian, definitely. That's a, a, an, excellent, <laughs> an excellent appraisal. You know what? Perfect. That's what this really is. It's not a mm-hmm. podcast. It's a casting session. Well done, Mr. Excellent. Guyver. <laughs> but so then you you're doing theater and then uh correct me if i'm wrong you you ended up on uh, the west end doing warhorse that's right absolutely um and again i think that was that that was totally uh due to those those roots in that kind of very poor theater technique because um mm-hmm. um certainly in, in england in the in the uh, West End, the kind of uh, where where the very popular theatre is now, things like you know, Lion King really have their roots in that in that field of theatre as well. Julie yeah. Taymor trained in a school in France called Le Coq, which is a physical theatre school that that has exactly that kind of philosophy of of making your own work, making something out of nothing. And you can see that in the aesthetic of the show and in the way, and even in that kind of big budget performance, how they how they use their bodies to tell the story uh, yeah. rather than really kind of you know there's expensive props and sets and lights, yes, but but at the heart of it is the, is the ensemble of of performers telling that story and that style of theatre has really become very popular now and that's kind of what war horse is a grand dialogue is, is people seeing that work they understand that way of storytelling and they're ready now for a story where the, the main character isn't even a, a human actor it's a it's a puppet yeah um yeah and you can kind of relate to it um and I'm sure most people across the world have come across Warhorse in one one way or another. But um, I, I got to see it before I was in it uh, when it was on at the National Theatre first, and it was it's an incredible show. It's a it's a beautiful show, and um, and I was very very lucky to to become a part of it. At the moment, it moved from the National Theatre to the West End, and and actually that that was a 
a huge life achievement for me, in fact, was having been at that Youth Theatre, National Theatre, when I was a, a teenager, to then come full circle and, and be working for them as a professional. It's something I'd always dreamed of. And so, uh, so yeah, that was a big moment for me. Um, for sure, mm. I can imagine. Was that your first professional gig? Um, oh, hell no. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the first one that I guess anyone would have heard of ever. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's that, it's that thing where, where you see kind of the people getting their best newcomer awards and things like that are people who've been working for 5, 10, 20 years. Um, of course. But, uh, but only now are, are kind of kind of getting to a point where, where people are recognising that. But I mean, no, I've worked on touring theatre shows where we made projects with masks, with puppets, where, you know, where we'd travel around we perform to um you know two or three people in one day because we didn't sell many tickets or, or big houses of people and um tiny village halls to kind of big big um uh, auditoriums uh you know in the, and going around schools as well and doing traditional shows i spent a very entertaining uh, few weeks doing uh two shows about sex education for going into nice. primary schools and secondary schools with, <laughs> with, a, with a team of four of us with some very well written very funny plays um uh kind of getting to talk to young people uh where we we go some scenes then after we say well okay here's one of the characters let's talk to them the kind of questions they'd come out with um were, were <laughs> amazing and, te- and terrifying at the same time so we'd be armed with all this knowledge to, to talk about these issues to do with uh, whether it's underage sex or, or uh, uh, sexual health and things like that um and yeah, that was a hilarious uh, summer. That's amazing. See, mm. <laughs> that's the other side of the dream you don't get. You're like, I want to be a oh, working man. actor. All right, cool. Here's what you're going to be oh, doing. <laughs> but, but that's the thing. All of those experiences, you know, that I, I would not have been in a place to to kind of work very hard and, and be involved in a show of that of the caliber like Warhorse had I not gone through all of those kind of successes and failures and struggles and moments of going oh man this is never going to work and oh I'm going to give it up or, or how, on earth, how on earth am I going to you know uh, kind of keep doing this with, with the level of rejection you get in an industry like this with the level of kind of uh, barriers financially there are as well theatre in England certainly I, I mean, in fact in America it's probably even worsely funded because it's very much private funding mm-hmm. um, and so um yeah, without kind of facing through all of those challenges I've, and and getting to kind of hone my skills, which are you know have a long way to continue to grow. Um, but um, yeah, I, I wouldn't have been ready to do a show like that at all. For sure, that's something I've mm. also learned by doing this show and talking to so many people. Is all experience is cumulative. You know, it's mm-hmm. like everything builds on top of everything else. Like you said, you were doing yeah. you were doing puppetry already and doing things like that, and then you find yourself on Warhorse. And uh, what what all I know you were an actor in the show as well as a puppeteer. Mm. And I was, I was a puppeteer first, very much, and really, I was really? first brought brought in as a, as a puppeteer, and then kind of had to fight a bit to be an actor as well. Um, nice uh, to kind of to kind of be to be seen as as both things, not just one. Um, sure. But um, so I came in as a, a hind puppeteer, which was the back legs, and then spent spent about six months working with a with an extremely wonderful team um, with an actor called Al Najari and uh, and an actor called Jane Leaney, and the three of us made up the horse. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you've had other people. I, I know you've had a couple of other people on the show who've worked on this as well. Uh-huh. But um, uh, but just just briefly, the the horse teams. You've got uh, someone who's on the head of the horse, um, uh, controls the ears, moves the head around. Someone who's in the in the chest, the heart of the horse, who does the front legs, and then someone who's in the back of the horse who does the back legs and the tail, and then you've got not one person telling a story, performing that character, but three different people who have to kind of sync up and synergize and listen to each other and breathe together so that they can be responding, improvising and performing as if they were one creature. And that, that's the kind of that's what makes that show fascinating to perform as well as fascinating to watch is that kind of ongoing. A challenge of being in the moment throughout the entire performance um, sure. and and so yes yeah, so I, I started in the back legs and i i after six months our contracts were renewed we thought we were all going to get kicked out it was right when we had a big kind of credit crunch in this country and and the financial crisis was going on and we'd we'd been in the theater for six weeks and got us all in a big circle out, guys we've got some news for you and you thought oh, man we're 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 done here um mm-hmm. and um and i said yeah we're gonna extend for another year and everyone went nice oh Oh man, this is great! But, <laughs> but um, oh wow, I did have other plans. So yeah, we all then had to go and assess our lives, and, and I thought, 
it's great I, and it was an opportunity for me to then say look i'm not just a puppeteer i, I want to act as well this is character this is tracking the show that, that al's doing and al's leaving where you do the front legs of both the horse but you also get to play this wonderful character who gets up yeah. uh crawls into no man's land the the, the gap between the trenches uh, to save the horse and finds himself face to face with a german soldier and yeah. then in a very kind of funny touching touching moment has to has to interact with that uh across the language barrier uh through humor um mm-hmm. and it's it's a beautiful it's a beautiful role and it was great to do that as well that's amazing so did you ever do any other part of the horse or you're the hind legs i did the, i i did i did the hind legs six months and i did the uh front legs probably for uh, two years after that wow total. yeah so i spent a big chunk of time doing that show do and, you have a preference um, yeah um Oh, wow, I think probably the front legs in the end are more suited to my body type. Um, it's, uh, the, the, the front legs, the, the heart uh, controls the breath, the, the breathing slot right. for the horses in there. And so you're, that, that's really kind of the emotional uh, thermometer of the of the creature, whether you're breathing fast or slow or, or deep or shallow. That's really telling the rest of your team how that horse is feeling emotionally. Whereas the back sure. legs really can ground it, ground it physically, or it can push the, like, the motor in that animal that will push it forward or stop it dead. Um, and the head's really telling you what it's looking at, what it's thinking, thinking, and then what it's atten- where its attention is. Um, so we're really kind of communicating with each other physically throughout the performance. And, and yeah, I really enjoyed that, and that kind of emotional um, interaction as part of it. Sure. It sounds mm. so hard to have three people be one creature that close in proximity and like... Yeah, like you said, it's the perfect uh, exercise of everyone coming together, getting on the same wavelength to bring a creature to life. So much so that the audience is like, I know it's a puppet, but I feel for this horse. You know, it's incredible. Mm-hmm. But that is the absolutely. I'm, I'm, absolutely. And, and, you know, the language we talk about, it was very much, and this is all credit to the directors as well, mm-hmm. but actually we talk about as a character, you know, it wasn't like, like uh, the whole was the horse is an animal and it's doing these things like, yes the horse is an animal but really you know what is it doing in this scene what's its intention what does it want here okay you know it's, it wants animal things it wants food or it wants comfort or it's afraid but you know what we we talk about it as if it was a character character that had an impact on every single scene had a desire whether it got that or not in every moment because a lot of the time there are human characters talking and then what's this horse doing in the background and why is it doing it? Right. You know, you've got a lot of freedom to investigate that night after night. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. I love how mm. puppeteering is so closely related to your journey. Like it's not just acting. It was always acting and puppeteering mm. and then how they both coincide with your story is pretty amazing. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I was very lucky. Very, very. Lucky. <laughs> yeah. And you know, if you don't ask me, I, when I was a kid, a teenager, whatever, uh, are you going to be, what are you going to do when you grow up? I would not have told you I was going to be a puppeteer. I would have had no idea. Sure. That, that that was even something you could do. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, and and so yeah, that's um. Then it just yeah. worked out. That's I, I, mm. I've learned. Luck is preparation meets opportunity. You know, like Absolutely. You said, if you hadn't done everything you did before, you wouldn't have had the skills required to be in the West End doing Warhorse. Like it's all, it all makes sense in the end, and that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I know you worked on the uh, the 2012 Olympics. I know Derek Arnold did, and I know you did. Yeah, although Derek and I didn't work on the same bit. We, we in fact we hadn't met at that point. Um Oh nice. Uh, yeah. So um Derek was working on on this wonderful kind of vast puppets with um, um with the Blind Summit in the in the section uh that that was based around telling the story of the National Health Service. Uh, I was involved with um through Warhorse, through the choreographer of Warhorse, Toby Cedric, um, had been had been doing some movement work with him. He invited me and nine other people to come along and help uh, teach and create work with the thousand volunteers in the Industrial Revolution section. Oh, so the section like where dancing the people could, stuff. Yeah, well, well, this, well it, I mean, if you can call it that, there's a moment where the whole green and pleasant land at the beginning, the whole stadium is covered in turf. I mean, yes. We've got these kind of little vignettes going on all over it. And then the drumming comes in and, and uh, Danny Boyle had brought along um, Underworld to to, to um um, compose this amazing kind of drum track and um, when that music comes in the guys start literally putting fingers into the turf and tearing up the earth and revealing the uh, uh, the kind of industrialized Britain underneath and, yeah. Um, so yeah so it's so a how on earth we did that and there was a, a kind of a mass movement team who, did, who worked and created a lot of that and that, that uh, mass movement of how those groups pulled that turf up and then we were kind of working with the movement choreography with all those guys um so that they're kind of half dancing half working and using those very kind of the root of physical movements that and giving that some kind of 
uh, artistic um, motifs to um, yeah to move them around as well. Sure, it looked great because I remember watching it, that and being like, "What is going on? It's such spectacle! It was so cool." It, it was crazy. Danny Boyle is a genius. I'm, I'm very excited to hear that he's directing a Bond film. Like yeah, yeah. Yeah, I look, I look forward to seeing that very much. He's amazing. So that's mm-hmm. a great segue. When did you start working in movies then? Um, oh, oh, oh yes, when did I start working in movies? Um, I, you know, I'd always kind of dreamed of working in movies. And when I was a teenager, I'd even I bought this book, The Guide to Becoming a British Stunt Person, nice. and I read the book, and I was like, wow, I should have started this ten years ago. Um, <laughs> um, um, and and subsequently, I've got to work with lots of wonderful stunt people. They're fantastic people, incredibly skilled, and I, I realised that was probably not. I probably didn't have the time to uh, to break bones uh, d- yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> and, and and just to train to the level in the level different disciplines that they that they train it as well you know, they have to be uh, at a kind of a competition level in five different disciplines like horse riding gymnastics martial arts you know when oh, you realize yeah. how many hours you know you say someone's good at something when they've done a thousand hours well they need to be good at five things so that's five thousand hours and yeah. they probably need to be much 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 better than good so so the kind of financial and and time investment is vast um, and i have no end of respect for some <laughs> forms um but um um but i i kind of didn't really find a way into film i couldn't find a way of film for me i was interested in acting in film but um you know, casting directors were, were looking for young people who came out of drama schools that did, you know, talking instead of wearing masks and clowning and falling over. Um, <laughs> and, and so um, I, it wasn't until I left Warhorse, and right at the moment I left Warhorse, um, I was uh, invited to go along to a film set with, uh, by, by, again, by Al Najari, who I'd worked with. And Al, had, Al was the founder of a, a, a theatre company that I, you know, I was writing essays about when I was at university. So I, I already thought I was very kind of fascinated by his work yeah. um, and he said well, can you come along and I said, and he's kind of told me how much you pay for a day on a film compared to a day in the theater and I was like I'm there this is great <laughs> uh, we, we were pregnant with our, our first child at the time we were it's just like I've just left this big show uh, I don't know what the hell I'm doing uh, and he's like yeah come along that's great so I said great so we thought it was one day we went up to this film studio uh, in Shepparton where we met a stunt woman who was hanging on a, uh, a wire over a bit of kind of scaffolding and polystyrene and um and we were shown this animation of of someone flying around the international space station for, which is about kind of 15 seconds long Ooh. and then um and uh and we worked with with the stunt performer the stunt coordinator uh to help puppeteer her movements as if she was in um in space and and the, that film was uh gravity very what? very early stages um and um, it turns out Alfonso Caron had had essentially animated the entire movie as a previs. Um, you know, the, the animators had had made the movie um, in in much simpler animation than you see in the cinema, and so they knew what their, what their shots were and everything, and they were trying to recreate it with their performance. And and yeah, you know, it, it was a struggle because it was a very demanding uh, film. Yeah. And so I think either Alfonso or someone on his team had had done some R and D and and realised. That perhaps having some puppeteers would be would be helpful, um, and so he'd seen Warhorse or someone his team had, and they said these are good people, and so so a, a, a handful of people from that team were brought in, and then that's how I'd ended up there, and um, and yeah, we we were there because when those actors or some people are on wires, the strain and effort to hold your centre is is such that you see that in the neck, you see that in the face, um, mm-hmm. and and. Whereas the beauty that he was, re- that Alfonso was really kind of trying to articulate was was the helplessness of being in zero gravity. Was that if you're a hair's breadth away from what you're trying to hold on to, there's sure. nothing you can do to reach it. You've got nothing to push off, nothing to hold on to. You are you are completely out of control. Um, and whilst you can make physical effort, there's no effort involved in movement. And um, right. and and so with the actors on the wires, if they were going to push off something and move, we would then take a hold of them and their harnesses or their legs their their bodies and move them so they could push off and then feel that real movement of traveling through space as if they were weightless you know and they still had to work very hard physically but but we were there to kind of create that helplessness of weightlessness and and also then to help interpret the 3d movements from from the animation to um uh to how we would actually put them in space with a camera sure and then the animators they film that and the animators literally animate paint us out of those pictures you know i'd say 90 percent of that movie is animated uh it's the actors faces 
and their facial performances um, and then for some shots their bodies as well that that's real there's one or two little practical sets within there mm-hmm. but 90 percent of it is animation and if you look at that movie and you watch that it's it's incredible what they, those guys achieved wow so um, you're telling me one of the first yeah. things you ever puppeteered in a movie was sandra bullock I mean that, that I don't. That, 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 that's almost un, unfair to the work she did because she she worked incredibly hard on that. But but it, I mean you could say that. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, that's pretty good. But, uh, that's yeah, pretty good. It was, it was, it was amazing. I'd, I'd never worked on a film set before. Um, wow. I mean I don't. You know and, and you know a lot of people don't get to go on film sets very often. Of course. And the first time you step onto one and you look around to you uh, and you are like, wow, this is like a dusty soundstage <laughs> in the middle of no. That's nowhere. right. And like uh, there's all these big bits of machinery and these big blue screens or green screens and um, and everyone's kind of making it up as they go along. Yeah, it's just... and, and that <laughs> I was like, that's what we were doing, running around little rural touring theatres, working out with our masks and our, and our strange props and our silly hats. Um, you know, this is kind of the same thing. These guys are going, you know, on a on a on a much grander scale. These guys are working out out. Okay, we've got this shot. I, I can imagine that everything would be pre-planned, and they do. And obviously, there is a lot of planning in films, mm-hmm. but but certainly that in in gravity, especially because everything was so was so new and so bespoke. Um, even the technology was being was being uh, custom built for a lot of it. So, um, um, everything was being worked out as we went along and tried out. And some things worked, some things didn't. Uh, these amazing kind of robotic arms uh, that they mounted cameras on that for some shots were for them were amazing, but for other shots they just weren't working at all. Um, and, and and so there was so much trial and error involved in that process. It, it blew my mind. Um, yeah, it really kind of opened my mind, my eyes to that whole world. Sure, it's pretty mm. crazy when you think about like shooting a scene. It's still just actors in front of a camera. You know, absolutely. Just, the scale yeah. is so different. That's that's mm-hmm. insane. That is funny though. Yeah. When you, the first time you're on a set, you're like, wait a minute, there's 300 people around this thing. Absolutely, <laughs> and probably most for most of them, it's their day job, and they couldn't give a crap. I know. You know How like, weird is that? You know, yeah, well, and I, that's a massive generalization. You know, certainly, certainly from the English film industry over here. For, yeah, um, I know from the American film industry from what. I've seen of it. Um, everyone cares very deeply about the work, of but course. at the same at the same time, how every day it is to to so much, Absolutely. so much of the crew. You know, you know, they're there, they're doing a job, and they are really good at that job. Mm-hmm. Um, but but um, that first day you step on a set and you you're like, oh god, this is amazing. Whereas these guys have worked on hundreds of films, you know, and, yeah, and, right. and, and in whatever capacity <laughs> they're doing, whether it's uh, from the catering to the uh, uh, to the facilities to the you know, they put up blue screens or green screens. They're electricians, you know. They, the amount of the amount of work that goes into them that uh yeah is, is amazing for sure i worked mm. on uh ballers with uh dwayne the rock johnson on hbo oh, wow. i did like cool. a, i was just a background guy for that yeah but i remember mm-hmm. there was one guy's job he just had uh little shots of espresso and he would just yeah. go around to the crew and just pass them out i was like That's oh man awesome. <laughs> and he's everyone's favorite guy everyone <laughs> yeah, and he's absolutely. like his hair is kind of crazy so what he yeah. does he'd give you one and then he'd take one and then he'd go and give you one and then he'd take one. <laughs> oh my god wow it was amazing goodness but, yeah but same sort uh, of thing you're like there's so many mm-hmm. people here you don't expect because you know uh-huh. on the other side of the screen absolutely i mean i, I have a tradition with really really my wife mm-hmm. kind of kind of uh, uh started but um uh which is when we go to cinema uh we have to stay to the very end of the credits good man like it, it is it is like a cardinal crime to leave for all of those names to finish going through. Um, sure. and we, we're trying to teach that to our children now as well, um, to the point where we went to um, their school to watch, uh, I think it was Paddington, um, nice. uh, you know, as a kind of after school club. And um, uh, and the film finished and the music started and the lady pushed it off and, and our son jumped up and said, no, the music hasn't finished. You have to play it all. <laughs> and we, we were glowing with pride my wife's here at the moment you with, our, with our youngest right now and she's she's grinning cause she definitely remembers that but yeah we were glowing with pride that's incredible <laughs> that's you need to do man there's so many mm-hmm. people especially nowadays like yeah. in visual effects in creature uh, performers yeah. like it's absolutely amazing how many people came together getting anything made with any amount of people is already a miracle but just the sheer absolutely. scale is incredible mm. which uh is a great segue into uh you got into a little space movie a little bit after uh gravity <laughs> yes, and, and well, and that was again. That was another combination of right place and right time, and how all these events come together. But um, uh, and again, um, through, much through the Olympics, really, um, I got to work with uh, as part of Toby Search's team, the lovely Paul Casey, oh, um, the best. and 
and yes, so yeah, I, you're familiar with Paul's work. Paul's, Paul's wonderful. Big fan. Lovely man. Uh, I had no idea really about, about this side of his work. I mean, I knew he'd done some stuff in Doctor Who, mm-hmm. but we'd spent our time running around volunteers on the Olympics and and uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, chatting away over, over that for kind of probably a year, nine months or so prep mm-hmm. we had for that job. Um, and, and it turned out we had the same agent as well. So, so nice. We kind of, we got on really well. Um, uh, he called up and, and said, well, look, Robin, I've, there's this thing going on. Um, and, you know, I've put your name on a list. And I can't really tell you what it is, but someone might give you a call. <laughs> call at some point. So, nice. Oh, okay. I'm sure most, most people who are involved, um, um, involved in that in, in that in that franchise, I think certainly on my side of, side of it, had, had a similar story to that in one way or another. Is someone phoned them up and said, right, there's something going on. Yep. I'm not allowed to tell you what it is. Everyone. But, uh, but yes, but <laughs> if the phone rings, you should answer it. Absolutely. Okay. Good, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and so, yeah, that, and that was um, that was The Force Awakens. Gosh, I can't even remember what year that was now. But um, um, So far back. But yes. So far back. Yes. And you've done so yeah. much. <laughs> so Paul Casey was um, here in. Yeah, well, yeah, well, a lovely Paul, and then I think also uh, Rick very kindly had um, been asked if he could recommend people he'd worked with on War Horse, and Derek and I had worked together on that. He kindly put my put, uh, put my name in a hat as well, and so so um, yes, I kind of got called in to to do some R and D very early on um, uh, when Pinewood Studios was un- undergoing some massive refurbs. Um, um, uh, when I forgot a call from uh, lovely Brian Herring um, yep. to uh, to R and D the Happabore in the very oh, nice. very early stages, and that was really kind of the, the main thing I was involved in in Force Awakens was this kind of vast thing we called it the Big Beast back then. Yeah, um, and um, and it started off as this kind of amazing kind of hippo type creature, and the concept art you know, hadn't hadn't changed so much. At some time, at some points it was perhaps more. Mm-hmm. had kind of cybernetic parts or things like that but um but the very early on really we just had a big plaster zoat which is kind of like like quite lightweight but but sturdy foam uh outer shell uh with myself and, and four other guys in there and um we, where i was inside the head of this creature which oh, was nice. kind, of, kind of like standing inside i don't know what's what's a comparable size you know a small car i guess i right? know for americans a tiny car yeah right but, um, <laughs> um um but um inside that I had um, this kind of small housing um, and then the other four guys each had, a, had the guys on the right hand side had their right foot inside a foot oh wow and the guys left hand side had their left foot inside a foot and so when they stepped with that foot uh, the creature's leg was attached to that and stepped with them and so we kind of just worked out coordinating these legs moving them around moving this head around around so it looked like there was a spine in there so it looked like it could breathe and charge around um, and and um, and that was all part of Neil Scanner's Creed Shop um, as they were really starting to do the very early R&D for all the different creatures there. And um, and so we spent a week kind of playing around with this this creature, running around with it, getting it charging around. Every time Neil came in, he's like, yeah, no, more, faster, <laughs> go on, yeah. <laughs> yeah oh, great. And he's, he's such an inspiring presence, Neil. He's the um, best. And if you watch any of his interviews, you can really, that really comes across. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. Um, but... Um, uh, so yes, yeah, so we'd always be, and then you would come in, and go, oh, go left, right, left, right. Oh, so we'd, we'd kind of choreograph these incredibly muscular, uh, strong, on things with with Paul Case in the outside, keep, counting us in and talking to us and keeping us all working together. Um, and um, yeah, and we had this thing charging around, rearing up in the air with its head. We imagined a kind of great beast of burden, kind of like a kind of like a cross between a, a hippo and a camel, um, and maybe a bit of wild boar as well um, on a vast scale um yes we had it running around and we tried i think we tried having kieran riding at one stage as oh. well yeah kieran shah um um and and yeah it was it was it was very exciting um, and then we carried on r and ding it and um and every time we came back in it got it got a little bit heavier as it had <laughs> kind of more things put in it more 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 metal work went onto the inside of course uh, um and more metal, uh, but still it kind of had this outer plaster out shell and we we're still moving the head around and stuff like that until we did this big show and tell uh, for for JJ and his team, and they loved it. Um, um, and yes, and it's part. You know, the, we were there, and then um, there was. Uh, I think it was Derek and Tom were in the um, yep. in in the little beast, which which became uh, oh gosh, the lugger beast. Now. Uh, yeah, the lugger beast. That's mm-hmm. it. And then and then a few of the the creature heads as well. We had this kind of show and tell, like this kind of strange marketplace in the middle of a big soundstage in in Pinewood, uh, where where. Uh, 
And when Neil sets up a show and tell, it's like, um, you know, he doesn't kind of set them up like museum pieces and then people say, oh, how does it work? Just, no, when people walk in the room, they're entering an environment. What? It's like a, a live show. And um, and so we're there ready, waiting, you know, we go, oh, they'll be here in, in 10 minutes. OK, so we get into their puppets and we get all ready and get moving around. And then we get, oh, it's been pushed back half an hour. OK, so we'll be, they'll be there in half an hour. OK. <laughs> OK. <laughs> These heavy puppets. Yeah. OK, they could be here in two minutes. Ten minutes later, okay, they can be here, and then eventually they arrive. Okay, go, 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 and then and, then, and you're bringing this world to life, and things are moving around. You're making sounds, you sounds, and and vocalizing the performance, you know, stuff they won't necessarily use on camera, but just to kind of create that environment. Sure, uh, um, you know, and so so in terms of like selling an idea, that's that's what that job is that day is to go. These things are real, and we need to believe them. Like you know, much like a theatrical performance, really, to to bring it back to that. Right, um, 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 and. Uh, and yeah, and so so that was this big kind of show and tell where we finally got the okay, yes, we're going to use this thing, and then we found out when it was going to be, and okay, it's going to be on a location shoot. That's exciting, and so they started then getting the okay and the funding and uh, approved to then you know build the skin, build the animatronics for the eyes, you know, get finalised designs. So yes, um, and. And that whole process started happening. Uh, so we came back in again and again. You know, we, you know, like sometimes there was a week in between, sometimes there was a month in between, sure. um, until we got kind of a final version that we were rehearsing with. Um, and at that point, we kind of been rearing up and running around. We got in this final version, uh, and it got heavier and heavier. But then they, <laughs> then they, then they painted it, and. Um, and you would not believe the weight that um, that I, I mean I have no idea how many tins of paint done with uh, uh, airbrushes went onto that thing. But the moment we got in there with the paint on, for me in the head, the guys walking around, you know, there's, there's a significant weight they were having to lift with their leg. I strap into this thing. You know, I've got my weightlifting belt on to to protect my spine mm-hmm. and. Um, I grab the bar to lift the head up and I can literally, I cannot lift it with my arms. I can bend my knees. I can shrug my shoulders. I can just about go up on tiptoes, but the weight with the animatronics and and the latex uh, skin and then, and then all those layers of of paint that have made it look incredible and photo real. Mm. Um, um, Just, we go, okay, so now let's find out how this thing really moves. Um, (laughs) And, and and so it comes this huge lumbering, uh, you know, six ton creature that that's kind of lugging through the sand and the desert, um, and 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 it was exactly that. We didn't really know exactly what its scene was until there. We're shooting it on the day, and I go, okay, we're here. We're at the water, the water fountain. Great, just say, yeah, come on, this is great. And we've we've <laughs> acclimatized to Abu Dhabi uh, just about, which for me being. I, I, <laughs> uh, this being a radio medium I, I have red hair fair skin yeah that's freckles. Right. perfect my for viking, deserts my, <laughs> I think my viking ancestors were not designed for um um uh, uh for the heat yeah. of the equator <laughs> um uh but but we've acclimatized by that point we're wearing these kind of um sand colored skin tight lycra leggings so that <laughs> our legs blend into that so that makes the animators work of, of painting them out later much easier right. um and and um and we're in this thing. They they can literally stick an aircon unit pumping cold air into its rear end uh, when we're not we- <laughs> when we're not working to kind of keep us alive. So actually, we were in probably more comfort than a lot of people were out there. Um, but um, we walk this this huge thing, which is brought on set on a on a great big kind of. Wow. Manitou, kind of, which is literally kind of lifted like a great big forklift truck, what, with a great long arm on it, and so it's dropped down and set. And go, okay, well, here we are with this water by this water fountain, this this water not this watering hole in the middle of the desert uh, on Jakku, and um, and and we're told, yeah, okay, come a bit closer, yep, come a bit closer to the water when it's head in the water. Like, oh, great, head in the water, fantastic. Yeah, we didn't <laughs> we didn't we didn't know about that. It's great, it's drinking. That makes sense. Cool. Just mm-hmm. and I'm hearing the radio. Just don't get the eyes wet, guys. The eyes have got servers in them. Don't get the eyes wet. Oh God. Yeah. Okay, go. Yes, get him a bit more. He needs to be a bit further in to get him in. Okay, so bring him a bit further in. And I'm, I'm kind of walking up this little hill where to get into the water. Yeah, he needs the head. Yeah, he's, let's get his head all the way in. Yeah, and so. <laughs> His head is me, and so I, I kind of <laughs> step up into this this pool of kind of tepid um, green. It's not, it wasn't a real watering hole. It's the, the guys had built this this beautiful looking set with right. kind of air air nozzles in it and stuff that create bubbles. And um, and then I st- I was like, oh god, here we go. And I had to step into the water, <laughs> stepped in with one leg. Now a bit further, I stepped in with two legs. I'm just wearing trainers under the all, 
or desert boots or something under these under these skin tight leggings uh-huh. that immediately fill with water. Um, <laughs> and they go, okay, now I'll make him drink. And I'm hearing, hearing Paul on the on the radio going, yeah, we're loving, yeah, yeah, really good drink, big drink. Yeah, he's loving it. He's great. He hasn't drunk for weeks. Yeah, so we're <laughs> thrashing their head around and really into, fantastic. Yeah. Um, um, and, and, and as we're doing that, the, the hole through which my legs come out is starting to take on water, oh, no. sitting heavier, um, <laughs> to, the point, to the point where every time they cut, they have these guys run in to take the weight of the body off us, oh, so, that, so that our spines can elongate again. Um, um, and so we, we were kind of, yeah, and that, that went on. You know, we probably had a shot for maybe an hour or so on that scene um, uh, with variations where, you know, John's drinking next to us or John comes and meets us or John mm. barges us out of the way, we barge him out of the way. Um, <laughs> and, the, and the one, obviously, the one they, they chose for the film was, was fantastic. It's such, it's such a beautiful, humorous and, and quintessentially Star Wars moment oh, yes. where, where, where they had this, this tiny vignette where he drinks and, and this big thing just whoo, knocks him yeah. out but again just where you go if you look at the thing you go wow this is that that creature is a whole world and every one of those creatures is a whole world and worth every second of screen time to, to feed your imagination to, to what is that thing's story you know who does it belong to and it just just and every moment like that adds to the richness um yeah so totally. yeah and that, that yeah but the amount of work that went into those those few seconds of performance for that were, were were huge um, sure. you know and he we actually had the things where he's lumbering across for some of the helicopter shots and i don't think i can pick any of them out in the film but um but you know who knows <laughs> maybe, maybe they're in there um it's a great moment that when you when you were telling me you're in the happy board and you said the head the first thing i thought was you knocked john boyega over right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and that, that was literally kind of Okay, and now charging towards the right of this this small car I'm inside. <laughs> I, 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 so I I hit the wall of that. That hits him. He then he then falls over. You know, I I can't see out of there. I've got a little tiny monitor. I've got no idea where he is. They're just having to tell me. Okay, so you're right and go. So I'm just running as hard as I can and going. I hope I don't hurt him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's method. It's method, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Um, but no, he was a great sport as well. You know, he was, yeah. Um, he seems the best. And then mm-hmm. so that creature moved on to. Uh, more creatures in a different realm that you worked on. I know you worked mm. on Fantastic Beasts, and uh, the footage looks incredible. You're like holding a mm. head. Talk to me. Oh, oh yeah. Oh so wow. So that that was that's so. It, it, it is like the flip side to Star Wars, the world of Fantastic Beasts, because in Fantastic Beasts there are uh, you don't see any of the, the puppets um, on camera. Everything you see is animated. Right. And so. There, we're really getting in there with with uh, much cruder, simpler puppets. Again, much more like the kind of things we'd be mocking up for our theatre shows. Sure. 10, 10, 15 years ago. And, um, you know, it might just be a head. It might just be a, a hand or, or just a, a small kind of rod puppet. Um, th- so the actors know what this creature is. They can look at it and they know, OK, that's what it is. It's this big. It's moving like like that you know is it feeling aggressive or is it feeling shy we can really give an emotional quality that performance so they they can pitch their performance that performance of the creature can be directed um and so there's no doubt on set that um what what is happening um in that animation um which involves us working very closely with the animation team and basing the, our performances very much of their animation studies as well and working with visual effects supervisors and um but it's 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 like um it's like a tennis ball on a stick uh, but yeah. <laughs> but uh, so much more it's about um uh, getting in there and, and having a kind of a live performance live improvisation interaction with those actors with each of these with each of these creatures in those films of which there are many oh, yes. um um and it gives our camera department something to frame on as well you've got a creature the erumpent in that first film is is, is you know bigger than the habibor it's it's eight meters long uh, i think four or five Huge. meters high yeah. it's massive and we built a whole wire frame skeleton for that um and there's lots of footage of that on youtube as well so i won't get oh, I've seen it. i amazing. won't get hunted down by warner brothers for telling that's right yeah. but, um, <laughs> um but um yeah and we we had three performers uh who, who were all in warhorse we had a, a rumpin head a rumpin heart a rumpin hind but they're in this much bigger creature you know and we did we did, didn't need legs because uh what the legs were doing would all be animated but what it did need was a head because we need to know where it was looking right. it needed a body because we need to know how big is that thing um and and then it kind of performed this choreographed sequence with with ed when he does this kind of mating dance with it which was which was is, is a surreal hilarious but also yeah. high stakes <laughs> moments in the film um, absolutely and you know we shot that for two days and trying to shoot that without some kind of puppet in there would have would have 
been such a complicated endeavor oh, yeah. um whereas when we when we bring something real in there um however however simplistic it is if we can if we can get the actors and, and the crew as well really to invest in it um for sure then 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 that the story of that digital performance that the animators are creating is being told already and the cameras are framing for it the timing is working for it um so when the digital performance does get created and does get put into those frames already there's there's interaction emotional and physical interaction with that creature and that and for me that's that's what's really exciting about it in some ways it looks like a kind of a, a, a much less interesting environment in the world of star wars but mm-hmm. you, the the interaction with the performers and the access we have to them um and and how key it is to to having something real there. Um, I mean, we've all seen moments where CG is is you know doesn't feel well integrated. Whether people, whether two two actors are looking at two different spots, you know, you, you pick up on those things even even subconsciously. I think right. if the actors don't know what they're looking at, or if they think they're performing to one thing, what's been animated is perhaps not quite the thing that um, uh, that they were imagining. You know, you pick up on that stuff, and so so the more we can we can integrate practical performance with with the visual effects world i think the the better um the better it is for everyone i agree i agree and that mm-hmm. that whole I, I forget the name of it you know what i'm talking about the the rhino mm-hmm. thing that you were oh the the rumpant yes. yes the rumpant the whole, the thing that you guys were in was kind of like a paper balloon looking thing but in the shape of the rhino is so cool the, that's the it it was yeah the uh, pierre bohano runs a prop modeling workshop and, the, and his, his design has created the this kind of this kind of rig to use, um, which was yeah, which was lightweight, so we get it on and off set. Um, it was it was easy to to work with. Um, also, because it doesn't have a big block skin to it, it, it's like a skeleton. Again, for the animators, it's much less for them to paint out when they're right. painting the body of the creature over as well. You know, it's, it's taking in all these kind of uh, uh, CG factors as well, which which I've learned so much about over the past few years, and it's uh, frankly absolutely fascinating. Um, Agreed. It's the yeah. other side of the coin. We have you guys that are like the creature mm-hmm. performers, the puppeteers, but like your legs are underneath the chin of the happer. You know, so uh-huh. it's like absolutely with that absolutely. with and the some, And someone frame by frame probably yeah. is having to paint that out. You know, and that's that's uh, a month's work for for you know a t- yeah a can sequence do, maybe I don't know. That's yeah. someone's yeah. job is to paint out legs. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Have you spoken to an animator? Yeah. They'd, uh, they'd be a really interesting person. To, I have. To, to, I actually yeah. had um, Hal Hickel on, who was the uh, designer and animator for K two. Oh wow! And wow, that's cool. I his development to process, that after this. you dude, you'll love it. His story, like mm-hmm. the fact that mm-hmm. he, when he was like, I think he was maybe twelve, he wrote a letter oh. to George Lucas talking about one day I'd like to make animations, and then flash forward twenty years, and he gets that letter signed by George Lucas after working on Episode One. Man, don't let go of your dreams. That was, when I was working at the National Theatre, um, that that was something I dreamed of for years and years and years for like for so long. And yeah, it's one of those dreams that I hadn't dared tell people about because it seemed so unrealistic at times. Oh, you know? I hear you. But, uh, but, um, but yes, never let go of those dreams. No. And, you know, and, and, you know, I have dreams today that, that today seem incredibly unrealistic and yet, you know, I gotta, I gotta hold on to them. I gotta believe them. That's yeah. right. You know what I always think mm-hmm. of when I imagine, uh, unrealistic dreams, I think about mm-hmm. the light bulb. You know, mm-hmm. if you would have went back hundreds of years, the idea of walking into a room and flipping a switch and there being light, that is unrealistic. It makes no mm-hmm. sense. Whereas now Absolutely. we're like, we have cell phones, you know? So it's like, realistic isn't really real. You know, there's uh-huh. so many possibilities that you're just cutting yourself off by under the, mm-hmm. under the totem of realistic. But yeah. Did you, did you work on Rogue One? Uh, you know what? I did not work on Rogue One because shooting Rogue One... Uh, was happening exactly the same time. I th- pretty think I think as we were doing Fantastic Beasts, right. uh, so I kept losing Derek Arnold to Rogue One. <laughs> I was like, Derek, are you free? No, sorry, dude, I'm doing I'm this thing. Oh, that thing. Can't okay. talk about it. You know how it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, oh yeah, that thing. Okay. <laughs> you did work on Life though. Yes. Yeah. How yeah. Cool yeah. Was um, that? It's a great movie. I mean, that I, it was. I mean, terrifying. Man, I, even reading reading the script was was terrifying. I don't know if they publish the script anywhere online, but um, um, if if they ever do, I highly recommend it because it's a it's it's a really well written piece as well. Um, yeah, that was uh, that was crazy, and and uh, that was all shot in practical sets as well. Well, gravity, all of the sets are animated. Mm-hmm. Uh, life, all of the sets are practical, really built. Yeah, they've all got really? the, the the lids taken off so the guys can do their wire work. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, um, uh, but um. But yes, I mean, the claustrophobia that you really feel in those sets, you know, I mean, I mean, it must be mind blowing being an astronaut. Um, right. Those people must have mental fortitude to, to the extreme because um, moving around inside those spaces, they're so small, they're so cramped. And then just just trying to get your head around the fact that 
there's no up, there's no down, there's no left, there's no right. Whichever yeah. way you face creates a completely new um, relationship to that space. Yeah, that was really cool. And, and playing around with uh, our work on life, we started off thinking we were going to be doing very much the kind of same thing we were doing in Gravity, working with the wires. And in fact, the wire guys and that and the way the way the wire shots worked the actors were much more um uh, self-determined so they'd be working in in these kind of swivel rings where they had a lot more control and and, and were required to do things on their own much more uh, and we ended up doing in, uh, attempting to do um kind of practical zero gravity effects so Ooh. obviously the, the the zero g world on that um is is animated mm-hmm. but whenever the actor is is holding on to an object you know they can't we can't expect them to mime the size of that object imagine he's holding like a a, a mug that you drink a tea or coffee out of mm-hmm. you can't expect them to mime the exact size of that object the same every time right um, or, or or even keep it the same within one take without the hand getting smaller or, or larger. I mean, try and do that now. Just yeah, put your course. hand in a shape and, and, and see if you can keep it there without it changing um, while, while talking to someone. Yeah, um, not happening. <laughs> so, so those objects had to be real. And so those objects had to get into the people's hands somehow. Uh, or, or if they had something like they have these, these great kind of light sticks, um, uh, these and light torches they use, like kind of advanced glow sticks that they're all forever letting go of and grabbing a hold of again um, that were practical lighting. And so these things, you know, they can't be CG because they're giving off their light sources. And so we were having to uh, uh, invent uh, systems using fishing wire, using uh, kind of rods that would be painted out by animators to um, to bring these things into the actor's hands and out again. Wow. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was a, a unique uh, endeavor. And, yeah. and again, started off, off, off with with the conclusion that essentially what we were being asked to do was impossible. And then, so how well can we fake it for camera under what circumstances? (laughs) Um, And we spent that that job pretty much every day or every couple of days making a new little film of, of, of these objects of, of one object or another. We know in this scene, okay, there's these great big duffel bags full of water that need to be moved. Should we make a little film of that to the director? We send it to him be like, no, 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 I don't believe that. Try and send it back to us. We we, we try hanging it on wires in this way or that way, or, or, okay, here's the the scene where he's getting into his spacesuit. What, can we do the helmets way way too much for us to do anything with but the gloves okay so we hung the gloves from fishing wires and if we spin them just so you get this kind of feel there's there's a real gravity movement to it we'd film that and you go yes it's that okay i want that tomorrow so we were really kind of day in day out having to to recreate and, and and create ideas and try things out and and yeah i learned a lot about tying knots in fishing wire um, <laughs> uh you know and 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 we worked very closely with their special effects department as well um who, mm-hmm. who were incredibly helpful and supportive and, and were obviously building their own rigs to do other parts of that and and we um we worked with them on on various different on floating a, a flamethrower at one stage they built and this is guy it turned out the guy who built the flamethrower um, whose name escapes me now which is criminal he was such a lovely man had built the original flamethrowers i think for aliens what um um and and then so they had this kind of this bespoke flamethrower they built that he on a little rc control like you'd have for an advanced remote control car mm-hmm. he'd, he'd rigged this up to this thing so he could yeah, turn the pilot light on from and remotely. He could he could fire the gas remotely and actually you know it's remotely fire this flamethrower. Yeah, you know, it was wow. a real flamethrower he built. Um, you know, it wasn't kind of engulfing, sending out napalm and engulfing. Yeah, of course, it was it was you know <laughs> kind of it was it was built to be like a converted kind of welding torch. But it was still it was like man, this guy's built a real flamethrower. I know, <laughs> uh, and is now controlling remote controlling it from over there. He is a genius. That's right. Um, Where are you going to get that? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I mean, in terms of the department, saying I. I love stuntmen earlier like special effects guys fascinate me you know these guys Same. are and you know and i think a lot of people on set see them sitting with with hazers sending out kind of smoke and smoke and atmosphere and 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 but these guys are engineers these guys uh deal with demolitions explosives oh yeah um, you know that they are you know they're inventing absolutely bespoke rigs for for this that and the other and creating all kinds of things and create and for every one thing you're seeing on screen they created uh, the prototypes and the things that, that that perhaps don't don't make it into the film for whatever reason whether it whether it gets cut out of the scene or whether it's just not quite right for this particular project that there's so many so much more that gets created that has to be made in that process it's it's mind-blowing and yeah they're, they're fascinating people absolutely that makes me think of this behind the scenes uh thing that they did for episode eight where they're talking mm-hmm. about the explosions on crate how they went through like eight different kinds of dirt because like, I don't know, oh, it just man. doesn't look right. And I'm like, wow, it's amazing. Yeah. It's like, needs to be more red, needs to be less red. And it's just mm-hmm. the amount of work that goes into it. And the people that are like, let's try this, let's try this. Like 
everyone's the best of the best and it's so cool because it really comes across on screen mm-hmm. you know it's really neat speaking of episode eight you uh mm-hmm. you were definitely a part of that yes yeah yeah uh, we yeah, have to been... talk about your claim to fame the thala siren <laughs> <laughs> that's uh... a. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's become a she's become a hero to many. That's right. Um, That's why I'm like Tom and Derek. Yeah. You're never getting past this one. It's gold. <laughs> mm, I mean, and, and I am. Um, you know, I got uh, um, pegged as like big creature, heavy head guy. That's right. So you... I, after the <laughs> you found so your like, niche. <laughs> we've got this, this other big creature, and it's got a really heavy head. That's and, right. Uh, okay, great. <laughs> um, I know a guy. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, and so yeah, I, I, but rather being inside the creature on this one, I got to be on the outside of it. it had a nice kind of bar uh, coming out the back, and this lovely big kind of T joint on it. You know, so I had great loads of movement, loads of control. I could see what I was doing, which was uh, so yeah. It was it's uh, it was um, I had much more control, kind of artistic control as a as a performer in with the Thalas Siren. Um, and that build was amazing. I don't, uh, oh, like, it's incredible. The guy, the guys went on location to Ireland. They scanned the cliffs. They did a lidar scan of the cliffs, so they have the kind of computer imaging of what that cliff face is. So they then kind of either printed out or or out, out or 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 rebuilt then in Pinewood, so they could build a creature that they knew would fit to that real cliff top. Wow. Um, um, and, and, and they built it in Pinewood, and we, again, had rehearsals there with this kind of amazing BD and the little baby thalassirens that are all around it as well. So there was a huge kind of menagerie of us there, uh, mm-hmm. kind of bringing, the, bringing this thing to life. And then, um, um, and then um, kind of after a very similar kind of show and tell where we had, had, had uh, kind of set, set the thalassiren up, kind of, and we didn't know what it was called at the time, so we called it the sea cow. Yeah. Um, and, and so, so we had the sea cow kind of, kind of bimbling around. Kind of, well, not bimbling around, but you know, looking around, keeping her alive, breathing. Tom and Derek inside. We had a- Aiden was, uh, um, Aiden Cook was involved. Oh, keeping, sweet. Uh, yeah, um, uh, as part as part of the uh, puppetry team as well. Um, um, and then, um, uh, gosh, oh, oh gosh, I, I forget who was doing the faces now because I was always stuck behind the head moving around. Um, Maybe it was Pat and Phil, perhaps. Um, but anyway, I, you know, there's there's a one. There's the team in the creature shop. There are such lovely, amazing, talented guys, oh, and yeah. I feel very, very lucky to have. I'm, I'm, you know, and feel very much like I, I'm definitely one of the guys in that world because um, they, these guys, guys are so experienced, have worked on so many projects, and in terms of the kind of uh, connection to. Um, the, the Jim Henson world that, that yeah. really has fed fed the careers of so many of those guys. You know, like I, I was watching stuff and going to the exhibitions when I was a kid, man, and, right. and those guys were working on those things. So, so um, um, yes, I, I feel so fortunate to be uh, a part of that team. But yeah, um, now you're one of those we, guys, Robin. Well, well, <laughs> I mean, let's call it what it is. <laughs> I mean, I, I had a conversation with Jimmy Sands, who who does a lot of the mechy building, the, the mechanical building of um of the creatures like like the Happerbore, but then so so many other things as well mm-hmm. um, that, that the creature shop create. And it turns out that we both went to the same exhibition on the South Bank Centre, the South Bank of the River Thames, um, where they where it was uh, Jim Henson's Labyrinth and Ooh. Dark Crystal were both um, were both having an exhibition. And I remember watching kind of a video by the Fireys. You know, the guys who get their heads they in the labyrinth. They terrify and, me. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> oh, I, absolutely, oh, absolutely, which is why I loved them. Right? Yeah. I mean, um, and I saw these guys in in these kind of, I think they're in, in um, kind of either black suits uh, on a black background as they're filming these guys. Very early visual effects yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, stuff. You know, and, and Jim Henson, we're talking about working with visual effects. Jim Henson, if you look at early Muppet shows, if you look at kind of um, sure. where he's been using green screen and blue screen and stuff like that, you know, he's... he's um, um, his, his work integrated visual effects very early on. Um, um, we both went to this exhibition. I probably must have been about seven or eight, and Jimmy was probably um, at the beginning of his career as an engineer, I think working in a, in a kind of assembly line type factory type work. Uh-huh. Um, and, and we're both kind of very inspired by this exhibition. Um, so when I, I never thought I'd be a puppeteer when I was young. I never dreamed of something I could do, but, but it certainly inspired my imagination. That, that world um and and jimmy went to that exhibition he told tells me that off the back of that he then looked up the name of the guy who ran the workshop wrote to him and and with you know was offered a job off the back of that letter wow. um that, from that very same exhibition that, that kind of had a big impact on me as well sure. um 
Yeah, and so he went from kind of working in factories to uh, to uh, building. He ended up the Ark for Age of the Lost Ark. Wow, if I, if I remember rightly, yeah, um, as well as all the amazing kind of creature stuff he's done for for um, Neil Scanlon and things like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what what is it like uh, seeing we, a Thal siren do... being driven by a helicopter? Oh my goodness! Yes, <laughs> <laughs> um, we're pretty much going like. Please don't drop it, <laughs> yeah, because, because otherwise Fair. we're going home. Yeah, Fair. <laughs> um, no, it's amazing. I mean, we we kind of you know you do feel a bit like the A team in moments like that where you kind of wreck you out across these tops and and you know we're all, all kind of like okay we've got this kind of creature to do and we're gonna do this creature and do this job right yeah and then, yeah, and then here's our time. big here's our big rubber puppets coming. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you put on fingerless um, gloves for no reason. Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, with my, with my puppetry gear. Yeah, yeah stuff. <laughs> Team um, puppet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we I mean we do joke um, a bit about having you know we've got VFX for visual effects. You've got. Um, uh, SFX for special effects that we are, are becoming FX for puppetry effects. Um, so, yeah, yes. so maybe maybe one day that will be a thing. I'll rock the patch uh, for you guys. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, seeing it seeing it come fly in and get dropped down onto the cliff was was was, um, was very exciting. Um, and then you know, kind of um, then get given hard hats and harnessed in and tied onto the rocks so we don't fall off and kill ourselves. And um, smart. Um, and the, the big move I remember from the Thalos Siren, you know. Um, uh, Quite apart from the story of Derek and Tom being uh, glued into, I've told you that I'm they sure have, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so the story for me, for me was um, uh, when we we're actually shooting that scene, uh, and we've got daisies on the rocks, and there's a lovely shot where the Thalassiren's head turns to look at her. Yes, it's her POV. Um, uh, that for me is on the other end of that. Um, uh, other than the head on, holding onto that rod, I've got a little monitor in front of me that's showing me what what the camera's seeing. Mm-hmm. Um, is me hurling myself against this harness <laughs> and hanging out <laughs> over the cliff edge so I can get the head to turn far enough around. I'll have to rotate this bar uh, uh, counterclockwise to make sure the head's not kind of not looking down at its toes while it turns around <laughs> um, to kind of keep that eye line correct. Um, um, and kind of teetering on the edge, hanging off his thing, feeling like an absolute kind of superstar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're just like, what's the guy in the blue suit doing? But, right. um, but for me, but for me, it was a, it was a moment of awesomeness, and I, I will treasure that memory. That's incredible. Of, uh, throwing myself around and looking, looking up. And, uh, uh, and... There's footage of that somewhere. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Um, oh, that's incredible. But, um, but my my kind of connection to all that. I mean, I'd seen, uh, those films. Um, I always remember when we were on set doing the Thalassine, I realized that Ben Morris was there. Ooh. Ben Morris, the, who, who from uh, Industrial Light and Magic, yeah. who I had originally kind of encountered uh, uh, on Gravity, as who'd been kind of looking after us puppeteers and our little kind of puppetry uh, units as a visual effects supervisor back then. And you just kind of you start to realize, wow, every, you know, it's all the same people again and again and again. Who, who we It's actually kind of a small industry yeah, oh, yeah. That, that we're in here. But these, these kind of very talented people crop up and again and again. People Absolutely. like Ben and 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 the ILM team. Um, yeah, I've noticed that as well. Ooh. It's a like Neil's very. Uh, it seems very loyal. You know, you guys oh, show up. Is. You're the best of the best. Why a lot of you have worked on all the movies. You know, it's incredible. Yeah, I, it's incredible. And and like all good leaders, he inspires loyalty. You know, he's one of these people who, you know, he asks for the best of you. Right. Um, you know, and and he he, he won't, You know, and he'll be there. You'll be doing shots and on multiple films I remember this you'll be doing shots where um, and, and you'll be hearing Neil's voice going bigger faster come on okay guys well that one was okay but I really felt like a, you know he, he, he won't let you off the hook man he will not of let course. you off the hook and I, and I love him for it because he, he's always asking for more he's always pushing for more Um, you know and he's in there himself helping between takes he's like getting getting the slime on the creature so that flesh really looks real and alive you know oh, oh, every detail is important to him he cares so much and that that's infectious and it's um you know and it reminds you why you love kind of kind of mad stuff for um, sure yeah. i remember uh derek was telling me when him and tom were in the lugger beast and mm-hmm. neil would go in between takes and be like i want my seven seconds boys you got yeah. that <laughs> that's it man that's it i know it's every, every, that's exactly that with the happy poor man he, i mean i don't know i can't remember exactly how many seconds he's on screen but it's like we're gonna earn them we are yep. gonna earn them <laughs> <laughs> we're not gonna collapse we're gonna stay alive it's it. amazing so what was the hardest thing you've puppeteered so far well, uh, ooh, well, I mean, that, physically challenging must have been the Happer Boy, just in terms of um, uh, it was so heavy, sure. it was so heavy, it was so hot that environment. I mean, in terms of in terms of like working on Warhorse, the stage show, we performed that show 
over 500 times wow. easily. Um, so, I mean, that was really like being an athlete, you know, sure. tra- training every day, looking after your body, stretching um, um, because because you're on stage for, you know, up to two, uh, nearly two hours with um, one of the horse tracks. And so um, that that was that was an incredible experience. One of the reasons why I loved that show. Um, mm-hmm. But then mo- mo- recently, I think. Um, and we can talk about this now because it's 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 come out finally. Uh, the most recent Jurassic World. Um, uh, work, again, Neil's team uh, worked on the dinosaur, they did. the practical practical effects, and we had a wonderful uh, uh, puppeteered version of Blue the dinosaur when it's lying down on an operating table. I don't yes. want to give any spoilers because I know it hasn't been out for long. But Blue's on an operating table at one stage, and uh, we probably had at one stage up to eleven people on that puppet, wow. and it wasn't ch- it wasn't changing because it was it was physically difficult it was the technical challenge of that performance um, I, sure. I had blues head, blues head and and jaw mechanism um that that was I, you? That I was working on and then and then uh other guys like uh, tom was involved in the breathing the guys in the tail uh, um we had such a wonderful beautiful nice good exciting committed team on that puppet uh we, had, uh, we got to the point where some of our fabricators we ran that people saw our fabricators were going on on bulbs that puppet was incredible um there's an amazing featurette that they put out recently about the practical effects in that film oh, where, where they really go into it which and it's fantastic it um is. but and they had bladders where where there was a jugular vein there was a bulb that would bring the jugular wow. vein up there was a, a kind of a breathing breathing pulse in the nose and in the temple it had a, a servo animatronics in the eyes the uh, the snarl the nostrils and and then and three different people operated the kind of the breathing the claws had had a, a opening and closing mechanism but then a twist at the wrist and then a twist at the um, elbow as well you know it was such an articulate puppet it was um so the challenge of getting that together uh, all of us working together moving together keeping it alive responding in real time to the actors uh, you know because they were performing up there and we we're watching a, we're watching our performance on a monitor seeing what they're doing yeah you know, and try trying to really get them to invest that that's a real dinosaur they're dealing with um, so that we're not we're not providing a dance where we do the same thing every time. They touch us if they touch the neck, the neck responds. Or if they're expecting us to lash out a certain moment, we hold it that second longer to build up the tension, and then surprise them <laughs> with the tail. And you know, so that we can we can really be interacting with them as another as another character that they perform against and and bounce off and and that can be giving them energy as well as just giving a performance for camera. Absolutely. Um, and then mm. wait, you said you did the jaw and the mouth. Yes. So, yeah. Did you snap at Neil Scanlon? Because <laughs> I saw a clip where um, Neil um, like went to go touch it, and then it snapped at him, and it was gold. Oh, yes, yes, he, yeah, and, yeah <laughs> absolutely. I mean, uh, um, and fact, guilty. There were, there were a few times where where you know I'm watching on a monitor, and, and Neil's talking to me on on a, on a comms link, uh, so I I can't see Neil, but I can see him saying, "Okay, good, Robin." Yeah, and he's talking to people saying, "This is blue, this is blue." Yeah, put your hand there now, Robin. Robin, close the jaw. No, no, don't, don't, don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 I guess their hand was in the mouth then. That's okay. Right. <laughs> That's amazing. That was the best parts mm. of that behind the scenes reel when Neil was like, oh, mm-hmm. and then it snaps. He goes, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, there's that. I was like, hmm, <laughs> who did that? Robin? Yeah. Yeah. It brought, definitely brought out my, my mischievous side. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Mm. I love it. Oh, that, that that was that was really exciting. And again, talk about the obviously when the dinosaur is getting up and running around. That's that's a harder thing for us to do. But, yeah. but in terms of the the kind of cooperation between the visual effects department who do the animations and our practical effects, you know, we were both they 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 really worked with us, the visual effects department. And obviously, they were they're augmenting shots throughout the film, whether there's a dinosaur in it or not. But um, but they were really wanting to keep as much of the practical effects in there as well. And 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 they were real allies in that work. We work together. And go. What's the best way to do this shot or that shot? Um, um, mm. Do we want? You know, would we build up a dinosaur hand close up so they don't have to animate it, or we can have something real in there? Um, and yeah, and so all, all of that was um, was a very was very successful in my opinion. Um, uh, in that you really felt like they were very much more tangible creatures in this in the most recent Jurassic World. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, that's why the original ones were so good and hold up so well. You know, Absolutely. real dinosaurs. Absolutely. I still remember my friend sat next to me in cinema teenager throwing his popcorn in the air when the raptor head shoot, uh, shoots out um, in the when they're trying to turn the electricity back on. Oh yeah. Um, and that moment is 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 amazing. Yeah. It is. Um, it is. Mm-hmm. And now you're a part of it. So well done. Oh, there we are. Well done. Oh, cool. But uh, can you believe oh. we've been talking for over an hour already? 
Uh, wow. Um, uh, yes. Oh, there we are. Yeah, I've got yeah. some phone. Just, yeah. cool. Wow, that's amazing. Oh, yes. Yeah, so well, I guess I should, I should let you get on with your with your work, Brian. Dude, well, I Brian, hope you've had you, a good yeah. time. Uh, it's been great. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, I, I feel like I should have asked you more about your work. But no, you I um, drive. <laughs> <laughs> That's my show. I find people who am I find interesting and let them tell their story. I'm just good at facilitating. Oh. You know, great. Oh well, it's been it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Brian. I, I I listened to a few of the episodes. I listened to um um I listened to oh what was the animator's name now? Um, Hal Hickel. How, I'll listen to Hal's on next. Yeah, that's exciting. Let me know what you think? I, uh, I appreciate anyone who takes any time to listen, and even more so to to talk with me for a bit. Like this was really cool. Oh, it's my pleasure. I mean, I'm a big podcast person myself. You know, whenever there's something I'm interested in, I'll find podcasts about it. I'll listen to them, and you know, it's it's a kind of it's a good form of self education when you haven't got much time. I you. Absolutely. I hear yeah. you. But where can people find you online? Um, online, I've got a website, uh, uh, robingiver.co.uk. Uh, that's Robin G U I V E R dot co dot uk. I'm at, on Twitter. I'm at Robin Giver. I'm depending on how busy I am. I, I'm not very active on Twitter at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, my, my website's got information and things like that. Yes, my my Facebook is just pictures of my kids. So that's yeah, right. <laughs> probably, probably less less relevant to people. Uh, fair, fair. <laughs> cool. Well, this was great. I, I'm so glad you had a good time. And uh, if you ever want to come back, doors open, man. Oh, it's a pleasure. Lovely. Sweet. Thank you so much, Brian. Absolutely. Cheers, man. And... Hello, my friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it is at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. Let them know we got some cool stuff going on over here. Also, uh, I've finally broken down and made a Patreon. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that at patreon.com slash Jedi Brian. On that note, Special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, and Daryl. Your support means everything, and I cannot tell you guys how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.